So the next type of research that's important um, for species conservation are demographic studies. And this follows the fate of individuals over their lifetimes. And several of these you can add up to get different rates, like mortality rates at different ages, um, reproduction rates, those types of things. Um, you can also look at growth. Um, and this is similar to mark recapture studies, but instead of trying to estimate population size, here we want to get enough individuals so we can look at um, growth, reproduction, and survival. So we're hoping to recapture, in this case, the same individuals over and over again so we can make these estimates. So this is um, one way, this is one type of mark, um, putting bands on songbirds. There are lots of other kinds of marks, um, including putting tags. So a lot of times with um, large hooved mammals, they'll put ear tags on. Um, we see that with um, like large marine mammals, sometimes they'll put tags on. Uh, you can use the individual's markings sometime. What I mentioned with the orca whales, they have different markings on their um, tails. You can do image analysis by taking pictures, so like unique patterns of tiger stripes or unique patterns um, on elephant ear scars. These kinds of things can all be used to um, identify particular individuals. So one thing we often want is population age structure or the ratio of different age classes, such as the ratio of adults to juveniles. Populations that are mostly old individuals um, often indicate problems with recruitment or um, having young, mature to be reproductive individuals. So we want to know if the population is growing or not. And we talked about this with um, human population size and how we could look at the age structure in human populations and tell if it's a stable or increasing or declining population. Um, and we can use this same thing for animals as well. Recruitment is the process that new members are added to the reproductive class um, in the population. Um, and in most cases we have fertilization embryonic development, childhood to adulthood. So we want to know how many individuals make it um, to adulthood. If young age classes are absent and the populations are almost all old, that means that there's some problem with reproduction. Um, it's not, you can't tell automatically if it's um, with fertilization or embryos or somewhere in the uh, childhood young um, adult, uh, young stages, excuse me. So not all of these ecological patterns can be studied um, on short time scales. A lot of times we need long-term data, especially when there's a lot of variability in population size and demographics. This is one of the challenges with amphibians. We mentioned before that amphibians are the most um, threatened vertebrate order. And a lot of this has to do with their um, very variable population sizes. So it's very difficult to detect a decline if the population goes up and down a lot, just naturally. We need to also track the effects of environmental changes. Sometimes they have a lag time, which means a delay um, that that you see later on. So an example is air pollution causing an insect population to decline decades later. So long-term monitoring is really important. It's good for identifying current status, um, but not as good at predicting the future just due to uncertainty. If we don't know what um, weather or habitat characteristics are gonna be in the future, it can be very difficult to tell um, what's going to happen in the future. Um, it also can be difficult to separate out long-term trends in population size from these annual fluctuations. Um, as I said, particularly difficult in very variable populations. 
Um, it can be helpful to determine whether management efforts are working. So we can get baseline information um, on a few different populations, apply some sort of management um, to a random set of those, and then see if the ones where the management was applied change over time relative to the ones that, that weren't managed. We can also engage the public in um, conservation efforts. Um, and community scientists are really important on this front. Um, these are people that, in their spare time, help collect scientific data. Um, you may have heard them referred to as citizen scientists, but there has been a push recently to rename them community scientists um, so that uh, it doesn't have any nationality or citizenship um, connotations to it. The idea is just that any member of the public contributing science. Um, and this can be really helpful for long-term monitoring um, as well. Um, so this is an example of a long-term data set where um, they were looking at flamingos in um, Namibia. And you can see that we're looking at the amount of rainfall or the bars through time. And then the green indicates the amount of breeding. Um, and the red years are years where there were eggs produced but no hatching individuals. And we have information like this. We can correlate rainfall with breeding success um, and the amount of breeding that occurred um, to better understand how different environmental factors affect um, population size as well as reproduction. Um, so some long-term data, as I said, comes from community science. Um, one of the best um, examples of this is something called the Breeding Bird Survey, which was started in 1966. There are 2,900 routes that are surveyed every year by birders, which are basically people that are excited about birds. Um, and they commit to go out and collect this data every year. And it's become very, very useful for understanding changes in population dynamics of different bird species. Um, and uh, there is a lot of really helpful information being generated by people that just like animals or like plants. Um, there's a lot of smartphone apps these days as well where you can collect natural history data um, or collect uh, the location of um, different species. Um, one really good one that I use is called iNaturalist. You can put it on your phone. You can also use it on your computer or your um, tablet. But um, basically, you can take it with you. And through the app, you can take a picture of species you see. And you don't even have to know what they are. And you upload this picture. Um, and other people will help you identify it. If you do know what it is, you can write that down. But um, it's kind of fun to take pictures of flowers or insects or birds or um, whatever. And if that's if you like wildlife and um, you don't want to be a conservation biologist for your job, you can still participate in this kind of thing um, through community science. And the great thing about iNaturalist is you can do it just whenever you feel like it. You're not committing to going um, a certain amount of time anytime. It's just if you happen to be going on a walk and you see something cool, you can take a picture if you want to. Um, there are lots of other examples. Um, this is a list of uh, community science projects if you're interested. Um, there are um, websites where you can sort through um, different camera trap pictures and help identify animals from your laptop if you don't even like to go outside. Um, this is one that I particularly like. It's called Zooniverse. Um, and they need citizen scientists to help them do different things. And there's lots of different science projects on there, but a lot of them, there are a lot of camera trap projects where they've um, taken thousands or millions of photographs and they need to identify the wildlife. And so people at home can um, help out. And it's fun because some of them are in um, sometimes there are ones in New Zealand or different places in Africa. So if you want to see wildlife um, 
that we don't have here or learn how to identify them, this is a really cool way to do that and help science out. Um, so long-term monitoring um, is often needed to understand um, the underlying reasons for changes in populations, um, which means that you need data on the population itself that we were talking about, but you might also need data on other things that might affect the population size. So these could be abiotic things like precipitation, temperature, or different soil properties. It could be ecosystem processes like water quality or soil erosion, or even um, other community members. So you might want to keep track of the species prey. Um, is it possibly a reason for declines in this population? Or perhaps um, keep track of their predators. Um, there is federal funding um, through the National Science Foundation um, for certain sites around the country um, to have long-term ecological research. And this is a Im very important program um, through the National Science Foundation. Um, and they call them LTER sites. And they, um, to even apply to be an LTER site, you have to have at least 10 years worth of data. Um, and the idea is to keep that data going for the long term so that we can learn different things. Um, and we can, different um, scales are important for different types of ecology. So most ecology falls in, um, in this range where we're looking at um, changes in days um, to months even. Um, LTER sites, the idea is to be able to collect data over years, decades, and potentially even centuries. Um, and this way they're able to look at things like eutrophication, population cycles, um, succession, which we talked about before, migration. These are just some examples. Um, when you get into things longer than centuries, um, that's often termed paleoecology um, and paleolimnology. And so these are longer term um, cycles where we're looking at more things like evolution, um, forest succession takes long enough that that can be in that category. Um, but longer term things the LTERs don't deal with. Mm -hmm.